Thanks, everybody, for having me and for coming. What an amazing venue this is. I can't believe it. Fantastic. I'm going to tell you three very short stories from my book, uh, Radicals. There it is. Uh, these are fringe political movements, people that live outside the way that we would consider to be normal. But I want you to think about this. Everything that you now consider to be politically normal, your received wisdoms, the things you hold to be obviously true, were once upon a time considered to be radical ideas, dangerous ideas, impossible ideas, until they weren't any longer. And the bad news is, that what we've seen over the last 18 months is just the beginning. We are entering into, I believe, a pretty significant period of very turbulent politics. And we are going to see many, many more radical movements come into the mainstream. And I think of all the different big social trends that are going to change our politics, technology, above all, is the driver. And I'm going to give you three stories of technologically-led radicals who are trying to change our politics. Anybody who is a Democrat who cares about democracy should be very worried by this graph. It was uh, a survey that was done a couple of years ago asking people whether they considered it to be essential to live in a democracy. And then they broke this down by decade of birth. Now, what you can see is that people born in the 30s and the 40s, people in their 70s or 80s, high proportions of them across the developed world think it is essential to live in a democracy. But every decade on, as people get younger and younger, they are less and less likely to think it is essential to live in a democracy. Sweden, you'll be pleased to see, still tops the table in terms of the highest proportion, but the trend is the same. So we are entering in, I think, to a pretty major period of disgruntlement with the politics that we do. You can see people born in the 1980s, people in their 30s, late 20s, people like you. Very low proportions of them think it's essential to live in a democracy. There is appetite for something different. And story number one is one of those things. The Italian blogger comedian Beppe Grillo, one of Italy's most best-loved comedians in the 1980s and 1990s. He, uh, this is what he looks like. He, in the 2000s, became enamored with the internet. He saw that the internet had this incredible opportunity to change politics. He said, we don't need political parties anymore. We can use the internet to get around them. They're corrupted. We can talk to the people directly online. We don't need journalists. We can find the information ourselves. The internet is going to radically change how we do democracy. And in 2009, he decided to set up a political movement, called it the Five Star Movement. And everybody thought it was a joke. I mean, he's a comedian after all, so it stands to reason. But he said, we're going to completely change how politics is done. Everything is going to run through this blog site, my blog, Beppe Grillo's blog. In fact, he registered this as the official headquarters of the new movement, the Five Star Movement. This is their HQ, an online blog. Every decision that the party took would be made on the blog, where anybody could vote in decisions that were going to be taken. Elected representatives of the movement would be chosen in open online primaries. And uh, he invited people to use meetup.com to, across Italy, start meeting up in groups offline to discuss his ideas and come up with their own solutions. Oh, this is never going to work, everybody said. It's ridiculous. You can't have a comedian being a politician, not even in Italy. People started signing up in massive numbers. By 2010, 2011, there were hundreds of these online meetup groups. And then in 2012, in the general election in Italy, 25% of people voted for this party that was three years old, run by a comedian online. And if there were an election held tomorrow in Italy, it would be the biggest party in Italy. He promised to completely tear up the rule book and he did it in three years. Remarkable story. And I think the demand for 
digital democracy, involving people more in the decisions that we make in society, is going to become an unstoppable force. The only problem is, Beppe Grillo is also a comedian who is pretty rude, pretty obnoxious. He argues with everybody all the time. He calls Silvio Berlusconi a psychopathic sex dwarf. <laughs> His critics may say that's a fair description, but I don't think it really helps uh, consensual politics. And this blog that he runs, wonderful, brings thousands of people to it where people, they get involved in the decisions that the movement makes. It's incredibly empowering. But it's also creating new centers of power. The people that run this blog get to control what questions are asked. They get to make the decisions about how far people are involved. And that has led to a small cabal around Beppe Grillo who run the site. So this is the future, in a sense, the near future of our politics. Yes, digital democracy, wonderful, brings people in. But be under no illusions that this also can make our politics more emotional, more aggressive, more oppositional, and create brand new centers of power that, in some senses, can be every bit as worrying as the offline world. That's Beppe Grillo. He's a visionary. He's, but he's not as visionary as the next story about a transhumanist. No one in the room's a transhumanist, are they? Probably not, maybe a couple. Transhumanists are people who believe that we can and should use science and technology to radically change what it means to be human. Everything we can do with technology to overcome the limitations of the human condition, we should. We can use technology to end aging maybe overcome death entirely. Artificial intelligence chips in our brains so we can learn hundreds of languages. We can restructure our economy using robotics and automation so we can sit around and go to talks all day and wouldn't have to work. Magical. The problem is transhumanism is a very, very sort of scientific, academic -y movement. And in 2015, this guy gets in touch with me and says, I'm a transhumanist. His name's Zoltan, by the way, which is like a perfect name <laughs> for a transhumanist. It really is his name. And says, I'm a transhumanist, and I want to create a, a, a mass movement for transhumanism, because these questions, artificial intelligence, life extension, these are going to become really important political questions for society, and nobody's talking about it. Uh, and he says, I'm going, to run, I'm going to run a cat, I'm going to run for president. I'm going to run for president. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to build this huge coffin bus. It's going to look like a big coffin on wheels. And I'm going to travel across America on my bus. I'm going to call it the immortality bus to raise awareness about the lack of research in anti-aging technology funded by the government. And I'm going to bring the message of transhumanism to the people. Would you like to come on the bus? I was like, yes, I'd like to come on the bus. That sounds like the best thing ever. He didn't win the election, by the way. Just, if you're not going to read the book, that's the, that's the story at the end. But he, ra he did run this campaign. This is the immortality bus. <laughs> and we travelled across America, and uh, we went to a biohacking lab where he got a chip implant into his hand, a little RFID chip implant, so he could unlock his phone just with his hand like this. And um, amazing stuff. I mean... The problem was it actually only worked on iPhones, and he had a Samsung phone, so he couldn't <laughs> do it, believe it or not. This technology always causes problems, doesn't it? But we travelled across the country, and this is the, this is the incredible thing. Journalists fell in love with this story. He put the whole campaign on because he knew, as a tiny candidate with no hope of winning the election, of course, he knew he needed to put together something that journalists like me would cover. And boy, did journalists like this guy. Because he was talking about immortality and artificial intelligence and robotics, and better still, he was doing it on a really old bus that was called the Immortality Bus. Every single major journalistic outlet wrote features about this guy. The BBC, The Guardian, The Spiegel, The Verge, I mean, The New Yorker of all places, the transhumanist nominee for president, Salon, everywhere. And this is the amazing thing. 
When I first heard about Zoltan in 2015, when he was telling me that life extension science was developing rapidly, and artificial intelligence was going to transform our economies, and we needed to start thinking about that politically, I thought he was mad. Roll forward to now, just two years later, and the things that Zoltan was talking about on this ridiculous bus tour are actually starting to come into view. They are serious problems. And I predict that in the next five years, ten years, questions of life extension and artificial intelligence and what it's doing to our economies are going to be talked about as seriously as health, education, immigration are today. And it took a crazy guy with a ridiculous party and a silly bus to be the first one to bring that up politically. There's that saying, at first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, and then finally they agree with you. And this is what happened with Zoltan. Final story, Liberland. Liberland is the newest country in the world. Here it is. There it is. On the border of Croatia and Serbia, that little red patch of land, seven square kilometers. Newest country in the world. And also, strangely, one of the most interesting bits of land in the world, disputed territory. Every bit of land on this planet, apart from a bit of the Saharan desert and the Arctic and Antarctic, is claimed by a sovereign nation state, apart from this. Now, this is a weird and unusual border dispute because Croatia, which is here on the left side, says that belongs to Serbia, and Serbia says it belongs to Croatia. It's never happened in the history of diplomacy. <laughs> it's, it's all to do with the course of the Danube River in the 19th century and after the Croatian War of Independence. The, the Serbians wanted it to be the current Danube. The Croatians said, no, it should be the 19th century Danube. And as a result, no one's claimed this bit of land. And under international law, the first person that turns up, sticks a flag in the ground, gets to say it's theirs. Can you believe that? This guy did that. <laughs> Vic Jedlicka, he is the president of Liberland. Sticks his flag in the ground, writes to every single head of state in the world, and says, I declare Liberland the first free republic that is truly libertarian. Voluntary taxation. Where anyone can be a citizen. We're going to change what the nation state is. If people want to get together and commission their own services from the free market, that's fine, but no government's going to force anyone to pay any taxes at all. And we're going to use cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and build decentralized markets using a blockchain technology to create a truly libertarian paradise. And hundreds of thousands of people signed up. And he got loads of investment. Loads of investment. Thousands and thousands of dollars started pouring in to this project. Now, no country in the world has recognized Liberland yet, by the way, so don't make the trip over there. In fact, if you try, and I did try, the Croatian government will stop you at the border and send you away. But they are behaving and acting like a nation state. They have all the trappings of the nation state already. They have a football team. <laughs> they have a wine. They have their own beer. Uh, they had, a, uh, they had an, uh, an architectural competition while I was there to determine what this future paradise would look like. And these were some of the entries. Amazing. I mean, it, it actually looks like this at the moment. <laughs> but you have to imagine, because if you can't imagine something, you're never going to build it, are you? And again, it seems like a ridiculous idea, but is the nation state, with that centralized government, with centralized enforced taxation and strictly controlled borders, is that the model forever? I mean, it's a pretty recent invention. And look at the way technology is transforming our society and our economy. And I think nation states are going to start getting weaker and weaker. And we need people like Vic Jedlicka, even though it is just a piece of land and grass at the moment, to imagine what else might follow it. And it seems ludicrous, but there are hundreds of people investing in this idea, including some very, very rich people from Silicon Valley who believe strongly in the libertarian philosophy. Now, that's three stories, and the lesson from all of this is 
Of course you don't have to agree with everything these people say. That would be ridiculous. There's lots of bad radicals as well as good radicals. But radical movements have always been the driver of change in society. It's the people outside the mainstream that can imagine something different and force all of us to kind of change our view along with theirs. So even if you disagree with these people, at the very least, they force you to think, to imagine something different, to spark some idea in your own head about how the world might be different. Like I said, at first, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, and then they agree with you. So what I suggest is that you find these radical people, these unusual thinkers, you pay attention to them, you listen to them, you may disagree, but don't ignore them and don't laugh at them, because one day you'll actually probably agree with some of them. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you for listening.